When I am dead and gone, they'll never be able to say that I was anything but a man of the people. I, I, I know what the people want. The people don't give a fuck about Naeem Hines and his route tree and his increased usage in the Indianapolis offense, meaning that he's a good value at RB78 this year. The people don't give a fuck about the training camp battle between Isaiah Spiller and Joshua Kelly. The people want the biggest, baddest, most important takes. And so today's video, I am diving deep into this giant brain of mine to extract the five players who are the most important, most pivotal to your 2022 fantasy football leagues. And that's why I'm Noah Hills. And you can catch me on Twitter at No More Parties. Let's do it. <laughs> The number one most important player in fantasy football this season, maybe not number one, but number one out of these five, is Derrick Henry, who last season finished as the RB1 on a points per game basis and is now being drafted as the RB4 and at the 108 on underdog right now. And basically the thing with Derrick Henry is like, if we knew that he was prime, healthy Derrick Henry, he would be the 101, the 102, or the 103. Like it would be him, Jonathan Taylor, and Christian McCaffrey, one, two, three, in some order. But there are legitimate concerns with Derrick Henry this season. Number one, he broke his foot last year, now has some sort of metal plate or d d titanium screw or wooden board strapped to his foot. And he's a big dude. Big dudes, it's hard for them to recover from injuries and, and stay healthy for a really long time. We see this in the NBA. Big dudes get hurt. There's just a lot of weight on their joints, on their ligaments, on their bodies, on their bones. It can be tough. And while I don't know that Derrick Henry is done, it's not a good sign that he's now operating with like inhuman pieces of metal inside his body after getting injured really for the first time last season. The other half of that is that even prior to his injury last season, he had a fairly severe dip in efficiency relative to where he had been most of his career. He was obviously like getting the ball a ton, rushing for a lot of yards, scoring a lot of touchdowns, workload was as high as ever, but on like a per touch basis, he had taken a step back. You know, on top of that, this offense has lost AJ Brown. Like who knows if they're like as good of an offense as they've been the last couple of years. And all of those things combined to make Derrick Henry like perhaps there's too much risk there to take him at the 101. And so now he's being drafted at the 108 per ADP, like on average, but taking him at the 108 does not mean that he's not risky. It's not like he's, he's risky at the 101, but not risky at the 108. You have the same upside versus risk decision to make at the 108 as you would at the 101. You just have worse alternatives than the guy picking at the 101 does. And Henry is not dropping to the 108 because like, you know, at if he was the 101, we're getting 100% of prime Derrick Henry. He's going at the 108 because we're, we know we're getting 90% of prime Derrick Henry. Like that's, that's not the case here. It's possible that we get 90% of prime Derrick Henry, but you also might get somebody who's like completely washed, in which case he's a wasted pick at the 108. He's a wasted pick at the 308. He's maybe a wasted pick at the 4 or 508. Fantasy leagues are going to be won and lost on the fallout of this Derrick Henry situation. Is he over the hill? Is he still effective? Is he going to be a little bit more like injury prone and fragile going forward? Either the guy at the 108 is going to get like a 20 to 24 fantasy points per game stud running back at a discount, or the guy at the 108 is going to light his pick on fire. My take on this situation is that re the reward in taking Derrick Henry doesn't quite outweigh the risk of taking Derrick Henry this season until like the mid to late second round when we start comparing him to guys like Javante Williams versus comparing him to guys like, you know, Justin Jefferson or... Najee Harris or Dalvin Cook. Like, I'm much more comfortable taking him over a Javante Williams than I am taking him over a Dalvin Cook. The number two most important guy in fantasy football in 2022 is Michael Thomas, who last year didn't play at all, but is now being selected at the wide receiver 29 spot and the 509 by ADP. Last time we saw a completely healthy Michael Thomas, he was the easy wide receiver one in fantasy football back in 2019. He set the single season receptions record. He was absolutely dominant. I think he had like a five point per game advantage over uh, Chris Godwin that year, I think was the, the wide receiver too. He was just an absolute stud. And the last time we saw Michael Thomas at all, like ignoring whether or not he was fully healthy, he played at a 97 reception and 1,064 yard pace while dealing with like a high ankle sprain and hamstring injury back in 2020. He's now a full participant in practice, like he's he's back with the Saints, but the risk still here is that he's just never the same. And if that's the case, you'd be blowing a fifth round pick on on nothing. Like you, you 
You take Michael Thomas, he's toast, you you flush your fifth round pick down the toilet. But the thing is, at a fifth round price, like, I don't think that's an especially, like, unlikely outcome for anybody in the fifth round. Let's look at the guys going, like, right before and after Michael Thomas by ADP right now. Rashad Bateman, we think he's going to take a step forward. Who really knows? Maybe he just is kind of like a complimentary receiver. DK Metcalf, you know, we've seen him be good before, but, like, he's getting a massive quarterback downgrade. J.K. Dobbins is coming off an injury of his own. Who knows what he looks like? Uh, Chris Godwin is going to miss, you know, how many weeks? We don't know. He's coming off an injury. Then there's Michael Thomas in between those guys. And then Darnell Mooney is the next guy. He is, maybe his quarterback is trash. Maybe his team is trash. Like, we we don't know. There's there's no certainty with Darnell Mooney. Amon Ross St. Brown, was he just super productive because, like, everybody else in the offense died last year? Who knows what happens with him this season? Then, like, David Montgomery is in this group as well. Like, is he toast? Does Khalil Herbert get more work? This offense is probably going to suck. Like, there, it's not like you're taking Michael Thomas, pulling him up into some range where, like, you're, you're bypassing a bunch of sure things. You're taking Michael Thomas amongst a bunch of other dudes who could you know, who could be good. Like, I believe in Rashad Bateman. I believe in, in Chris Godwin and, and J.K. Dobbins to some degree. I like these players, but it's not like they're, they have some sort of, like, elite upside and, you know, high floors that Michael Thomas does not. Like, all of these guys could be nothing. Last year, Cooper Cup was like an automatic league winner for anyone who took him in the early fourth round. He was the wide receiver one by a mile. He was not a, like, a premium pick in fantasy football drafts. Michael Thomas doesn't even have to have a Cooper Cup ceiling in order to be a league winner this year. He's being taken later than Cooper Cup was being taken last season. But you're not allowed to be surprised when he puts up, like, A.J. A. Brown, T. Higgins-type numbers with a YOLO ball quarterback in Jameis Winston who... In the past, I believe in 2019, supported both Mike Evans and Chris Godwin as top four wide receivers in points per game in the same season. Like, this is a dude who will chuck it around the yard. Michael Thomas is the most talented receiver on this team. If he's healthy and his participation in practice indicates that he is, we have no reason to believe that he's not the same player that he used to be. And even if he's 90% of that, he could be a really productive receiver this year. Wide receiver 29 prices is absolutely stealing Michael Thomas in fantasy football right now. The next guy I want to talk about is Kyle Pitts, who finished last season as the tight end 11, is currently being drafted as the tight end 3, at the 308 by ADP. If you ignore touchdowns, I think he scored one touchdown last year, kind of bizarrely scored one touchdown last year, Kyle Pitts. If you ignore touchdowns, take it, take them out of the equation for all the tight ends in fantasy football, Kyle Pitts still would have only been the tight end seven, which I say only, like we think Kyle Pitts is a really good player. I think Kyle Pitts is a really good player, but even if he had scored touchdowns or even if we ignore touchdowns, like he wasn't that impressive relative to other tight ends around the league, but he was a rookie. And there are no like fancy stats that I have to share in favor of like Kyle Pitts being a league winner because necessarily the argument for Kyle Pitts being a league winner is that we have to see things from him and really from any player that we have just never seen before. Like the, the case is that he's a unicorn which I'm I'm fairly bought into, but like he's also being priced like he's a unicorn. He's on a terrible team. He no longer has Matt Ryan. No longer has like a solid veteran at quarterback. And in order to get on the Kyle Pitts train, you have to draft last year's tight end eleven in the third round. The risk there is massive, especially given that the Falcons are going to be bad, and especially considering that in order to return value in the third round, Kyle Pitts can't just be good. He has to be elite. Let's say he puts up the same 78 receptions, 808 yards, and 8 touchdowns that Dalton Schultz put up last season. That would be a step up from his stats from last year in both the receptions and touchdowns department. It would be an objectively awesome season from nearly any tight end, but that's not worth a third round pick. Like Kyle Pitts could improve upon his numbers from last year to a fairly severe degree and still be disappointing relative to where he's being taken in drafts right now. He needs like 90 receptions, 1200 yards, and five touchdowns. Like two of those three need to hit for him in order for him to return value in the third round. The margin for error is very thin, but I think he can do it. Like, I'm kind of in on that happening. And if he does, he's going to end up being a value even despite being taken so high relative to guys like Mark Andrews and Travis Kelsey who are being taken 10 to 20 picks earlier who could end up with similar stat lines if Kyle Pitts is the Calvin Johnson type unicorn we think he is. The next guy I want to talk about is Cam Akers who last year tore his Achilles early on, 
only came back towards the end of last season, doesn't really have a fantasy finish, but is now being drafted as the RB19 and at the 410 by ADP. And I I really think Cam Akers is the biggest like Schrodinger's cat in all of fantasy football this season. We're pretty sure he was good in college, but that like terrible Florida State offensive line meant that he was super inefficient. So like it's kind of hard to assess his actual performance. We're pretty sure he's got these like Wolverine level injury recovery abilities, but yeah, he came back from the Achilles really fast, but he was kind of shitty when he played after coming back from the Achilles really fast. So like, does he really get credit for coming back really fast when he was bad? Like, I don't, I don't know. And we're pretty sure he's now in line for some, you know, heavy workload on a great offense. But Sean McVay, every time somebody asks him about Cam Akers, he also throws Daryl Henderson's name in there and pumps him up right alongside of him. And Matthew Stafford's arm is now either falling off or completely fine, depending on the Twitter doctor you follow and, you know, the reports that you believe in. And Akers himself is now dealing with his own soft tissue injury and has not been practicing in training camp. It's very easy to look at all of those things like as a collective and conclude that like Cam Akers, while hypothetically talented, just has too many red flags to really trust this year in fantasy football. And that's probably where I'm personally at with him right now. But the thing is that Akers is the guy that I'm most scared to fade in fantasy football this season. Because all those things that seem like red flags could end up just being red herrings. In which case you've got a young, explosive, full skill set running back on an elite offense available in the late fourth round. That guy's a solid RB1 and a league winner, especially at cost. The last guy I want to talk about is Trey Lance, who last year didn't play much. This year is being drafted as the QB7 on underdog. That's the underdog ADP. On Yahoo, he's currently the QB 13 by ADP. On ESPN, he's currently the QB 13 by ADP. And on NFL.com, he's currently the QB 13 by ADP. The best ball sickos over at Underdog are all over Trey Lance's upside. But if you're playing in like a home league with your friends, with coworkers, with your family on one of these like big boy platforms, Trey Lance at QB 13 is still the cheat code late round quarterback that you need to draft this season. In two and a half games last year, he came in when Jimmy G went down at, at halftime during one game, and then he started two other games. So in essentially just two and a half games of action last year, his 17-game pace was 4,066 passing yards, 27 passing touchdowns, 14 interceptions, and 1,095 rushing yards, which would have given him 20.7 points per game, making him the QB8 on a points-per-game basis. He's got Debo Samuel, he's got George Kittle, he's got Brandon Ayuk, those are, that's an elite set of weapons as far as I'm concerned. And now Kyle Shanahan has had a full off season to design this offense around Trey Lance's skill set rather than Jimmy Garoppolo's skill set. So there's potential that he could be even better than what he showed last season. The risk is that he just isn't that good at real life football. Like he was a raw toolsy prospect from, you know, the, the FCS level of college football but as we've seen from like Jalen Hurts last season and even guys like Cam Newton back in his MVP season, uh, RG3, um, even Lamar Jackson to some degree, like these guys don't need to be Tom Brady as pure passers in order for these like dudes with, with nice legs to smash in fantasy football. Like it doesn't even really matter if Trey Lance kind of stinks as a passer of the football if that's what ends up happening. As a 10th round pick on Yahoo, ESPN, and NFL.com, the league winning potential for Trey Lance as the QB 13 right now is well worth the cost.